And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. The reason that is usually put with the paragraphs of chapter 8 is because it's a continuation of what Jesus was already saying. Now you have the chapter break there. I'm sure you all are aware of this, but the chapter breaks and the verses were not added until the Middle Ages. I'm very, very grateful for whoever that was. You really made it much easier. But every now and then you come along somewhere and you go, man, maybe that verse would have gone better over here. And, and this might be one of those cases. But because they are so tightly connected, it works just fine. So we are coming now at the end of Jesus' lesson from chapter 8. This is where you remember Jesus identified Peter, or Peter identified Jesus, goodness, as the Messiah, as the Christ. We talked about what that meant, the coming king of Israel with all that that entailed. And when Peter tried to warn Jesus against going to the cross and saying, far be it from you that you should suffer, Lord, Jesus rebuked him very strongly, gathered everybody together and said, look, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to deny yourself, take up your own cross and follow me. And we talked about what all that meant. And then he finishes that lesson with verse one saying, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. And this is a bit of a cryptic saying because you go, okay, what did Jesus mean by that? And there are a number of opinions, and there have been since the early days of the church, on what Jesus meant by that because it's not immediately clear. Typically in the Bible, when it refers to the kingdom of God, it's very obvious what that means. To a Hebrew hearing this in that first century, the kingdom, with a capital K, was when the kingdom of Israel would be reestablished like God had promised to Abraham, like God had promised to David, like the prophets had, had said, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the rest, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the kingdom. There obviously, of course, is a spiritual aspect to that as well, that the Lord reigns from heaven. There's the kingdom of heaven, and those terms are interchangeable, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven in your Bible. So most of the time in the Bible, when you read the kingdom of God coming, we're talking about the end. We're talking about when Jesus returns and establishes the kingdom on the earth. Now, that wouldn't be controversial, except that Jesus says there are some standing here, meaning the disciples he was speaking to, who said, who will not taste death, a very uh, Semitic way of saying die, by the way. Tasting death is a very Hebrew way of speaking, which little things like that is how we know for sure, in case there was any doubt, that the writers of these books, while they were written in Greek, it was not their first language, because you still see little turns of phrase like that, tasting death. But we'd say, okay, well, it's 2024, and the kingdom of God still hasn't come with power yet, and all the apostles are dead. <laughs> Everybody from that age is still dead. So what's going on here? Well, we can understand, first of all, that Jesus knew what he meant by this. We also, even if you believe, well, Jesus believed that it was going to, I don't believe that, there's some that say it, you'd have to ask the question then, okay, then why did the disciples put in what they would see as Jesus obviously getting wrong? So it's obviously referring, I think, something other than the end, the eschaton, when the kingdom comes. So there, there's really three other big options that, that, come up here. And, and these are all debated by good godly men. Uh, the first one is the resurrection. When the kingdom of God comes with power, you all, with the exception of Judas, <laughs> will live to see the risen Christ, which really that's what will usher in the kingdom of God with power. That's one option. Number two is Pentecost. Because when did the church begin? When did the, the kingdom really begin to spread across the world? It was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And those men, they lived to see that day. Of course they did. But that's okay. That's one way of looking at it. But the other option is what's immediately going to follow this verse, and that is the transfiguration, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, is the transfiguration of Jesus. And I think that's our best option here. I think that the, the Pentecost one is, is close, I think, because in that sense, the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, is in your midst. It's among you, that wherever God's people go, there's the kingdom of God. Wherever Jesus is king, you could say, although we are still waiting for the final consummation. But I think the, the placement of this verse is significant. I think even the guy that was breaking up the chapters recognized that there was significance to what Jesus said. All the gospel writers, all the synoptics, they placed that verse right before the transfiguration. And I think that's the best way of looking about it. You are about to see the foretaste of the kingdom of God coming in power. 
And what they're about to see is a revelation of Jesus, which informs us, and boy, will this ever preach, (laughs) the following revelation of Jesus is, in fact, a revelation of the kingdom of God. That to see Jesus is to see the kingdom. That where Jesus is, that's the kingdom, and where he is not, it's not the kingdom. That the king and the kingdom itself are identified together. The Old Testament would talk about the coming kingdom in this very manner. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. This is the famous passage about the Son of Man, that really mysterious title that Jesus took to himself. Because it was one of those, he could say, what, to be a son of man is just to be a guy, right? We're all sons of Adam. But there's also this passage here that for those who had eyes to see what he was talking about, he was referring back to this. So Daniel 7, he said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, this son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So you see that, as far as it was revealed to Daniel, to see the king was to see the kingdom, that there is no separating the two, which is only true of the kingdom of God, because every other kingdom will continue when the king is gone that it will continue. It'll pass on to the next son or pass on to the next. Or it is a kingdom that is just as destructible as the king that is in charge of it. But this kingdom is different. That when he comes, it's an everlasting kingdom. It's an everlasting dominion. And to see this son of man riding on the clouds of heaven, to see him is to see that coming kingdom. This is why later on, when he's standing before the, the, the priests on the night of his crucifixion, they will say, tell us, are you the Christ? And Jesus will say, I am, and you will see the Son of Man riding on the clouds of heaven. And that's when Caiaphas tore his robes, because they knew that's Daniel 7. He says, yes, and you're going to see me coming on the clouds of heaven. I'm that guy. So the king is very closely identified with the kingdom, which is what I think Jesus is talking about here. When he says, you're going to see the kingdom come with power. Some of you are about to see this. And what are they going to see? They're going to see Jesus revealed as that son of man to them. And because this is true, even though the kingdom of God has not come on the earth the way it will, as the Bible describes, we can experience and live within that kingdom now. Because if the king is with us, And if the king is ruling over us, then wherever we go, we are spreading the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not one of these people that believes it is the church's responsibility to actually and literally establish a political kingdom on the earth in the name of Jesus. I think that is a misunderstanding of what Jesus said, because he's the one that's going to do that himself with the sword that proceeds from his own mouth. But there is a very real and meaningful sense that when the church gathers... When there's a house that is exalting the name of Christ and teaching their kids to follow him. When there are people that are taking a stand in their community to say, we will serve the Lord. Singing as we did tonight, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. That is the kingdom of God. Because where Jesus is king, well, that's his kingdom, isn't it? And if you want to know what his kingdom is like, really what you're asking is, what is he like? And what is he? Well, Jesus is everything the Bible says he is. The king makes the kingdom. And let's look at verse 2, and let's see what it was like. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now you might think, why would Peter say something like that? Well, verse 6 explains, for he did not know what to say, (laughs) for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud. Think back to Mount Sinai here, right? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Jesus only. Peter, James, and John, that's Simon Peter, and James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, 
They were Jesus' inner circle, in a sense. Jesus had the multitudes that followed him. He had the 70 that he sent out and commissioned. He had the 12 that were his apostles. And then he had these three with whom he had a very intimate and special relationship. These are the same three that Jesus took with him when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. They're with him here on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're going to be with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, even above the other disciples. They had a very special relationship with these. And he takes them up to see something no one else is going to see. He goes up to a high mountain. Now, traditionally, this is Mount Tabor. Although uh, in recent years, people have disputed that. And the reason being, in the other Gospels, it places this encounter they're having, uh, since it was only six days away from the confession of Peter, which happened in Caesarea Philippi, they think this had to be a, a different location up near that area. So most people would say this is what's called Mount Hermon today. And the Bible makes all sorts of references to Mount Hermon, and uh, there are some that see some really great significance in that. But since our passage doesn't draw that out, I'm not going to get into it, but it'd be a fun uh, study for you to do. Recommendation from your pastor, if you don't have a good Bible atlas, you should get one. There are some really, really great ones. I've got some recommendations if you want. I've got one that's really cool that has satellite pictures of all the area so that it actually gives you the, top the topography and they'll have articles in it. Uh, so you can look at these, and maybe you don't come up with you know, the answer, but you'll know what the options are and that'll be good for your Bible study. Well, it says that while he was on this mountain and another gospel tells us they were praying together and the disciples were sleeping. A lot of things happen when Jesus calls you off to pray. Don't, don't go to sleep because <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. He was transfigured, transfigured. Trans means to change or to cross. Figure is like your appearance. The Greek word is metamorphothē. Like where we get the word metamorphosis or transformation. He looked differently and Peter draws out the inspiration for the gospel of Mark. He draws out especially the radiance of his garments, that they were shining white. Now, white was a color in the ancient world that was very difficult to get. You know, nowadays you have bleach. It's very easy for us to get pretty much whatever color we want for our clothing. But back then, if you had something that was white, it would be whitish. It would be off-white. It would be like a tan color. And then if you were really royal and regal, you could get it bleached to a degree that it actually looked white. That's why the Roman senators had the white togas and so on. Purple was in that category as well. Red, crimson. That's why these were the colors of royalty. But, they're like, but this guy's clothes were shining like the sun. Nobody could bleach it that white. <laughs> And he's shining there before them. And Moses and Elijah show up in the pillar of cloud that we remember from the Old Testament. Now, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? I don't know. Maybe they said, hello, my name is Moses. Hello, my name is Elijah. Maybe you've heard of me. We don't know, but they, they knew who this was. And they were talking with Jesus. Boy, if I could have heard what they were saying. Uh, maybe they'll tell us one day, maybe it's not for us to know. I have a very interesting idea about this. And if this doesn't do anything for you, just, just leave it alone. But I am very interested to know what in his humanity might have been the, the boundaries of knowledge that Jesus exercised in his life. Now, we know Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. However, in his humanity, in his flesh, he emptied himself, the book of Philippians tells us. He set aside these things. I'm going to live as a man without access to any of these things for a time. If that trips you up, just consider this. Jesus was not exercising his omnipresence on the earth. He was not everywhere. He was in a single place. I think if you can make that leap, I think if you say, well, what about his omnipotence and his miracles? Well, we know that the Holy Spirit filled him up, and that's how he did all of his miraculous works, the same way we do. And then when we get to this omniscience, knowing all things... That's when it gets a little touchy because I never want to give the implication that Jesus Christ is not fully 100% deity. But I do wonder sometimes if there was a mental growth process that Jesus went through. And if you, know, you look at the, at the baptism of Jesus, for example, where Jesus is baptized. And Jesus would have grown up about 30 years old. Nobody believed him around, that he was the Christ around him. Nobody was telling him, you're destined for great things, Jesus. Nobody was telling him this. So maybe he grows up like we do. You, you learn how to hear from God. He knew that God was his father, obviously, from the story when he was a young man. But when Jesus comes out of the water and he says, you are my beloved son. And then he's immediately taken out to the desert. And what's the temptation he gets? Well, if you're the son of God, let's see you do something. 
And it could be that in his humanity, as Jesus had to learn obedience, perhaps he was coming to grips with this. And perhaps there was some encouragement or even some revelation that was coming to him from Moses and Elijah on the mountain. Could be, or it could not be. That's just something that I find fascinating to think about. Again, if that doesn't do nothing for you, leave it alone, because it does not tell us what it is. But I just like to think about that and see what it is. But he's, he's getting encouragement or instruction of some kind from Moses and Elijah. Very symbolic for you and I, the law and the prophets. That's what you got to learn, right? And now Peter <laughs> is overwhelmed. Now, there was a great man that said, it is better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. So maybe your mom said, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. Sometimes it's good just to shut up. But Peter, when he didn't know what to do, he said, well, I better say something. And so he, he says, hey, maybe we should build some tents. The word for tent there is skene, and it's translated in the older translations, tabernacles or booths, perhaps. Uh, this is the word that was used for the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. So it's not just, I'm going to pitch a tent for you. It's, it's speaking of building a shrine or of giving homage to these three figures. That Like there was the skene that was the tabernacle that the Lord lived in before the temple was built. Um, what, is, what I'm seeing here is that Peter is placing Moses and Elijah on a level with Jesus. Maybe we'll build three, three tabernacles for you all to stay in, and we can stay up here forever. Now, on one level, you think, wow, you're putting Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah? Those are like the greatest guys. Elijah didn't even die. You know, Elijah was carried up by chariots of fire into heaven. That's where the movie gets its name. Chariots of fire going up to heaven. And, and, and then Moses, it's, it's Moses. They still got carvings of him in the Supreme Court building, like the, the lawgiver, right? And Jesus is up there. And that's, that's pretty significant. But you know what? God wasn't having that from Peter. He says, yes, that's, that's pretty high to exalt Jesus. But he speaks. And just like the last time he spoke, he says the same thing. So this time it's for the apostles' benefit. He says, this is my son, Listen to him. Now, you might say, well, we should listen to Moses and we should listen to Elijah. And now, wow, this third Jesus, is, he's right up there with those guys. And God goes, no, 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 no. Him. Jesus is my son. And he's revealing his glory. Just for a minute, that, that fleshly garment was peeled back. And they could see who this was. And then they think, wow, he's as good as Moses and Elijah. And God goes, no better. Much better. And that's why you see at the end that they, they kind of throw themselves down to the ground, right? And as they look up, it says, no one was with them but Jesus only. There's something significant about that. That it was with Jesus, the one they were supposed to listen from. Remember, we are going through a transition in the Gospel of Mark here. Now, Peter does not, and again, Peter through Mark, is, is not trying to keep us in the dark. And he tells us in the very beginning, this is the story of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Boom, gets right to it. You know, get in, make your point, and move on. But he's also very skillfully bringing you along to that point. You see all the miracles. You see the casting out of demons. And they kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger until Jesus finally says, hey, who do the people say that I am? Elijah, maybe? One of the other prophets? Somebody special? Jesus goes, all right, who do you say that I am? And Peter goes, you are the Christ. And Jesus goes, that's it. And then Jesus' teaching began to switch, where he would still, of course, teach them parables, teach them lessons about the kingdom of God, about what's right and wrong and truth and, and the law. Now, with his apostles, he began to specifically talk about, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, but I will rise from the dead. He's giving them that next level of revelation. And this is really what we're seeing here. Jesus' identity as the Son of God. We talked last time about how folks are reluctant to take that step. They'll walk with you all the way, maybe even like the Muslims who say, yeah, Jesus is right up there with Moses and Elijah. I might even put him slightly ahead of Moses and Elijah, but I would never say he's the Son of God. The Al-Aqsa Mosque on top of the, dome, or, uh, top of the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, inside is written in Arabic, far be it from Allah that he should have a son. It's the line they won't cross. It's the line a lot of other people won't cross. Or they try to get cute and say, well, look, man, we're all sons of God, man. 
We're all sons of God. And you know, Jesus, oh man, that's my brother, man. He's my son. He's the son of God like me. Or some people say, ah, the Bible says lots of people were sons of God. Not like this. Not like this, they weren't. This is my son. Listen to him. But Lord, Moses and Elijah, he goes, when it comes to Jesus, forget Moses and Elijah. Jesus. It's not to say that there's nothing to learn from Moses and Elijah. But when it comes down to it, Jesus is the centerpiece of all revelation. We can be tempted to categorize Jesus with these other saints. And this is one, one reason why these other Christian traditions, Catholicism, Orthodoxy, whatever, weird new fascination with Eastern Orthodoxy recently I've been noticing. But one of these lines I absolutely categorically will not cross is the veneration of saints. We will not have images or even the names of other saints that are not Jesus Christ and pay them any kind of homage, give them any kind of prayer, offer them any kind of worship, even if you don't want to call it that, veneration, excuse me. When this happened on the earth, when Jesus was there, Moses and Elijah, the two guys that maybe we could all agree, okay, maybe put them on that list. God goes, no, Jesus only. Jesus above. He's not like these other men. As great as they were, better than you. But Jesus is above them all. He's exalted above, symbolically in this passage, the law, Moses, and Elijah represented the prophets. All of Old Testament revelation was building to him. Which is why if you get that right, the Old Testament is opened up to you. And it has an amazing lesson to teach you. However, if you get that backwards, you'll completely miss it. What you believe about Jesus matters so much. It is the question. Who do you say that I am? Jesus said. Now the common th theory you hear today, and people will say this like it's a fact. And it's, it's simply not the case. But Jesus might not have even been real. He's an invented personality. At least the version of Jesus we have now is something the church made up. You know, the miracle worker and the great teacher. Maybe he was a great teacher. Maybe he did some interesting things. You know, you know, holistic medicine has a whole lot to teach us. And maybe Jesus knew a thing or two. But all that stuff about the resurrection and that he was God. And Jesus never would have said that. They made that up. And we say, well, how do you know that? Well, first of all, the Gospels were written hundreds of years later. No, they weren't. You know when they said that? They said that back in the 1800s, before we started digging. And since then, we've done an awful lot of digging. And we now can factually, scientifically, archaeologically say that's not true. They said John had to have been written hundreds of years later, at the, at the least, because it's so theologically informed. And now we're finding copies of the Gospel of John, fragments of John, that are some of the oldest of any of the ones that we have. And we say, now you have to make time not for it just to be written, but to be copied and transmitted and sent somewhere else and then lost for us to have this version. So you, you can't say that anymore. Well, this was just a version that, that won out. That's the version that beat down all the other ideas about Jesus, and it really was more political than anything else. No, you can go back and read the minutes of the meetings they had, guys. Like, this is not secret. Sometimes people try to use your ignorance about a subject to try to convince you that you're wrong about everything you've ever been told. It's, ah, come on, everybody knows that. No, everybody doesn't know that. You go back, there, there is, since the very beginning, you see it already in the New Testament. There has been a standard of teaching about who Jesus was. And there was a boundary of what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. Now listen, when the church was a bunch of people that were getting fed to the lions... Nobody wanted to be part of that club anyway. So there was no need to lay down the law with people because, hey, if you join these people, you get your head cut off. So it's not really a club you want to be a part of. But over time, it became kind of fashionable to be a Christian. And all these people come in and bring in their Greek and Roman ideas, bringing in their other weird Gnostic thought. And so you had to get guys like Athanasius and the other fathers. Okay, no, you know, no, no. We're going we're gonna to write it down. And if you can't agree to this, you don't get to be a Christian. Now, did that lose its way along the line? Yeah, probably it did. But even that was not that long afterwards. It was not that long. So the idea that Jesus is just some made-up person, it's a factual. It's not what we have written down. And in fact, the apostles themselves knew people like that and addressed them. They wrote about people in those very days that were saying Jesus isn't what they said he is. It's, look, the mythological Jesus is so important for our culture. As long as we keep the myth intact, 
Don't you love how, this term is thrown around so much today, but don't you love how elitist people love to say things like, look, religion is very important for the, for the poor. It's very important for these stupid people that don't know what we know. We know that it's not true, but it's still useful. Let them believe it if they want to. Well, you know, Peter dealt with people like that too. And he actually referenced this story in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. For anybody that ever said, well, it's just a myth, it's just a legend, it doesn't have to be true. Peter said, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very ver voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Which holy mountain? This one. Peter's like, don't tell me I made this up. I was right there. I watched it happen. You just look. I know that Jesus was your best buddy, but you're kind of, even, even then, in the days of Peter, they were saying, you're inventing things. You're, you're, you're following myths. We've heard the story of the dying and rising God before. We've heard the legend of the hero. It's just another one of these. And Peter goes, no, no, no. I saw this. He said, we've been testifying to you since the very beginning. The power and the coming of our Lord Jesus. The power of his life and the coming that could happen at any moment. So we've been preaching this since the beginning. You know why? Because I stood on that mountain. I saw my best friend transfigured, talking to Moses and Elijah. And then God spoke from heaven, this is my son. It's the kind of thing that people would say, if God would just do that, I would believe in him. Well, God did that. And the guys that were there wrote it down. And they said, this is what happened. You go, I don't believe that. This is why, if you remember the parable that Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man, where the rich man goes down to, to Hades and he's in torment and he sees Lazarus being comforted and he says, let me go back and tell my brothers about this awful place. I don't want them to go to hell. And Abraham said, they have the law and the prophets, meaning they've got the Bible. That's enough. It's told them all about it. They go, no, no, no. They'll believe if somebody comes back from the dead. And they said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't even believe somebody come back from the dead. And what foreshadowing that was. Well, I can't read the Bible because I don't have any proof. Jesus rose from the dead. I don't believe he rose from the dead. The Lord knew what he was talking about. Maybe he was even speaking to our generation when he said that. There'll be a generation of people that won't believe he rose, so they're going to have to stick with the Bible. Some people say things now like, well, the church really made too much of the Bible. Now, I'd say Jesus made quite a bit of that Bible, my friends. So who is Jesus then? He is the eternally begotten Son of God the Father. That doesn't mean that he was made. That doesn't mean that he popped into existence one day. He has an eternal relationship of Father-Son with our God in that triune unity. When he came to this earth in what we call the incarnation, the enfleshment of Jesus, he took on humanity in its actuality, what we call the hypostatic union, that he is 100% God and 100% man. And you might say, that sounds kind of weird. Well, it is the only way the church is found to reconcile what the Bible actually says about him. And because he is both of those things, he is able to be our all-sufficient Savior through his death, and through his resurrection. As a man, he could die. But as God, he could die for everybody. There's a psalm, I believe it's Psalm 45, it could be wrong, where it says, how, it says, how can one man ransom the life of another? For the cost of it is very great. Even in the Old Testament, they were saying, even if one person was good enough, how could they die for somebody else? Don't you know how serious that is to pay for somebody else's life? You needed somebody whose life was more than life. What the Hebrews called that imperishable life. That's who he is. You will feel, and we are feeling in this day and age, the subtle lure to build tabernacles for other voices and other testimonies alongside those of Jesus, even in the church. Maybe it's out of this academic pressure to want to fit in. Maybe it's out of political expediency. Oh, friends, I heard somebody on, on the internet today, and they're a believer as far as I can tell, and they, but they were on some podcast or other, and they were talking about redemption and forgiveness. And it was great. I agreed with everything they said. But they said, this is why people need to realize. They need to realize the, the power of faith. I was like, no, 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 no. Not the power of faith. The power of Jesus. The faith in what? Faith in all kinds of things. 
You can have faith in a squirrel outside your window. That's going to be my God. Well, how is that any more ridiculous than anything else that people worship? I've been to places where they do worship squirrels and rats and monkeys and dogs, where they worship the cars they drive, bow down to them and offer offerings to them. You say, how ridiculous. Yes, because faith in itself has no power. It broke my heart because they were right in front of a willing audience that were listening to them. And I said, no, you've got to say his name. You've got to say his name because this is the one you have to listen to. Hold fast to that. And you might say, well, we feel like we're kind of getting squeezed out of the coalition. It's always been that way, brothers. It's always been that way. Nobody ever likes the ones that hold on to that torch of truth and faith. Jesus told us it would be that way. But we know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So do what God the Father said and listen to him. Amen? We'd end it right there, couldn't we? But let's move on. I'm cooking now. Verse 9. <laughs> and as they were coming down the mountain... He charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Hence, Peter's writing this book with Mark. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. It meant rising from the dead, buddies. And they said, they asked him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first. So, he, he was not above agreeing with the scribes when they were right, guys. Elijah does come first to restore all things. Now let me ask you a question, boys. And how is it written on the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Jesus enjoins his disciples to keep the secret until his resurrection. Then you tell everybody. And they did, which is why we know this story. And he starts to talk about the cross again. Listen, don't tell anybody until I've risen from the dead. And they go, wow, risen from the dead. What do you think you meant by that? Jesus, everything you say is so deep, man. Like, I don't even get half of it, but it's always so cool, man. And they're like, what does he mean by that? And it's really funny because they're always begging Jesus to speak plainly. And then the one time he does, they don't believe him. We talked about it last time. I won't rehash it, but... There was no room in their theology for a suffering Messiah. So what they did instead is they say, hey, we just saw Elijah. And that reminds us of a passage in the Bible. And the scribes are always telling us, before Messiah comes, Elijah will come. But here you are. Where's Elijah? Why do they say that, Jesus? You obviously know a little bit more about this than they do. And you told us to listen to you. So why hasn't everything been made ready for you? Now, what are they referring to? This is Malachi chapter 4. Verses 5 and 6. These are the last verses of the Old Testament. Pretty exciting. What did the Lord say? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So the last thing God said in the Old Testament before 400 some years, he said, I'm going to send you Elijah, and he will be there to bring everybody together and restore them to the Lord. And when he comes, you better listen, because if you don't, utter destruction is coming to your land. So they go, all right, well, Jesus is here. Did we miss Elijah? <laughs> Were they wrong about that? Well, we know what Jesus means here, because he, he says two things. First of all, he says Elijah is coming, and then he says Elijah has come. What does he mean? Well, first of all, by has come, he's talking about John the Baptist. And I'm not just pulling that out. In Luke 1.17, when the prophecy was given to Zechariah about uh, John the Baptist, who was to be born, he said, he will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Pretty cool. And then in Matthew 11.14, Jesus, when talking about John the Baptist, he said, and if you can receive it, he is Elijah who was promised to come. So he's kind of saying, this is a mysterious thing, and you might not get this one, but in a really cool sense, he was Elijah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Why? Well, because what did Malachi say? What was Elijah going to do? He was going to prepare the people to knit their hearts back together so that the Lord could come. And that's exactly what John did. Prepare the way of the Lord, the voice crying out in the wilderness, right? Calling the people to strong repentance, and then Jesus came. It was exactly what was prophesied. However, Jesus also says Elijah is coming, meaning he does, Elijah does come. He will come one more time. 
Now, we know that the land, as Malachi said, the land did suffer utter destruction because they didn't listen to Elijah when he came. But we also know from theology and scripture, Israel's going to get that chance again at the end of days. And we should expect that there will be that ultimate fulfillment when Elijah will return. I think this is the best reference you have to what is written in Revelation chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, where it says there will be two witnesses in the last days when the Antichrist is ruling over the world and having his way, there will be two men in the city of Jerusalem prophesying. So I say, how will anybody know what's true? God's going to have his guys. And they will have power, it says, to call down fire from heaven which Elijah did, to stop the rain, which Elijah did, and also to turn water into blood, which Moses did. So many people believe that those two witnesses will indeed be the folks we just saw, Moses and Elijah. Especially when you realize Elijah didn't really die. He was caught up to heaven in that proto-rapture. And then some people say, well, no, not Moses. There was another guy that was caught up to heaven, and that's Enoch even though the Bible really doesn't talk about Enoch very much, and it's really not relevant. I think that that's what the Lord is talking about, that these two witnesses will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. So he has come, and he is coming. They were right to look for Elijah. And I I do appreciate that Jesus is saying, no, no, the scribes got that one right. They just don't really understand that it happened right in front of them, and they missed it. They knew the scripture so well, but they couldn't believe it when it actually happened. But Jesus turns their attention away from Elijah and right back to the suffering of the Son of Man. This is the lesson he's trying to get across to them. Guys, I'm going to suffer and die and rise from the dead. They hadn't looked to the entirety of God's word. He goes, they go, hey, what's that verse in Malachi about Elijah coming? And Jesus goes, oh yeah, that is an interesting one. You know what else is an interesting one? Where it says that the Son of Man is going to be rejected and suffer. Remember that one, guys? He's trying to get their attention back, right? Now, what verses is he talking about? I read some of them last time, but I'll just read a couple right now. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. It says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. So Jesus is telling them, yeah, you're looking forward to the conquering king. That's very good. The Messiah will be that. But fellas, there's an awful lot in that Old Testament that talks about the Messiah suffering and dying. And you're missing that. This is why you can't understand when I say to you very plainly, I'm going to be rejected by the scribes and Pharisees. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again on the third day. And you all go, man, I never understand anything that guy says. Because they knew what category he belonged in, but they did not realize that this was also true of that. They couldn't fit that in there in the image they had in their mind. And indeed, both John the Baptist and the two witnesses that will also come in the power of Elijah Both faced death before the coming of the Lord. Elijah himself faced the wrath of a wicked woman who wanted him put to death. So did John the Baptist. Remember the story of Herod and his wife? And he was put to death. He died. The two witnesses will be struck down in Jerusalem by the Antichrist and then be caught up into heaven. That there's going to be a sacrificial element even to their lives. So Jesus is trying to tell them, look, suffering is a part of this. And you know what this reminds us? When we formulate ideas about God or salvation or right and wrong, you've got to look to the entirety of God's Word. The whole thing. Because not one letter of God's Word is going to fall to the ground. Even that weird little verse in Malachi about Elijah coming would have both near and far fulfillment in the life of our Lord Jesus. Paul will make theology, he'll make theological hay in the book of Galatians out of the plural or singular form of a word in Genesis. I've been told before, you're splitting hairs. You're splitting hairs when you're interpreting these things. Well, the Bible does quite a bit of that. Um, Your theological method is suspect. Well, I'm trying to use the one that Paul used. You can't do that, you're not an apostle. Really? Because I have the same Holy Spirit living within me. Seems like you just don't like the conclusions I'm coming to. 
You've got to look to the entirety of God's word. This is how you do theology. This is why if you ever see me do a theological message where I'm really breaking it down, there will be a long, boring part where I read about 100 Bible verses to you. <laughs> why? Because we've got to have all the data if we're going to come to the right conclusion. If you're trying to put together a puzzle and you don't have all the pieces, it will be incomplete. And then somebody will come along and sound real smarmy and say, the picture is supposed to be incomplete. We can't know all things. There's some pieces left in the box. Oh, don't worry about those. You're missing it. You're mi no, you're missing it because there's more in here. This tells us you got to read the thing, guys. Read your Bible. Read it. You must read it. If you believe this, this is God's word, that it's an inerrant book, it's inspired, it's infallible, it's authoritative for your life, have you read it? You've got to read something that significant. We live in the most literate society ever. Read his book. God could have given us anything. He gave us a book. I don't really like to read. Well, who asked you? <laughs> read God's book. 66 of them. Read them all. Oh, the genealogies are kind of boring. They're in there. I don't know why he put all these names in there. They matter to the Lord. Ah, the prophets are kind of boring for me. Yeah, well, you might want to dig around in those because Paul made his entire Romans theology of salvation based off a verse from Habakkuk. The last time you read Habakkuk. I know Zach teached on it, taught on it not that long ago. <laughs> teached. That's why he does the teaching. <laughs> you've got to read his book. And you've got to incorporate it all. You should be suspicious of people that lay out all the biblical data in front of you and omit things. Or lay it all in front of you and say... Here's why these don't count. And you can tell when they're doing it because they will always eliminate the things that do not adhere to the culture as it stands today. Well, we know this. The most common one I hear now is, knowing what we know now about homosexuality, we can't take these verses from the Bible literally anymore. That just says, our culture is more important than Jesus. I would never say that. You just did. Another thing Malachi would say often, he said, you have disrespected God's house. The people say to me, how have we disrespected God's house? And then he explains it to them. Don't you think if I was sinning, I would know? No, not always. That's why the Lord sends his people. So as we come to a conclusion here, there's two errors that we've looked at tonight. The first is to add other voices to that of Jesus. And the second is to pick and choose which truth you're going to listen to. Every cult, every aberrant group does one of those things. They either say, Here's the Bible, and here's our stack of books. Read these first. If you don't get to this one, that's okay. <laughs> we'll explain it all to you. And you, you try to say, what did Jesus say? Well, what this guy, what, what Joseph Smith said, what Brigham Young said. Oh, no, 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 what Muhammad said. What the Buddha said. I don't care what they said. Listen to him, said our Lord. The other thing aberrant groups will do is they will spend time picking out pieces they don't like. And you can always tell because somebody that's coming out of one of these, you'll read a verse to them and they go, I had no idea that was in there. <laughs> you ever had one of those moments? I think we all have. But the reason being is because it's been concealed. Because it's very inconvenient to the agenda you're trying to push if God had something different to say about it. Amen. But we're not interested in doing that. Jesus is the one we listen to. I stand before you guys and I promise you, all I'm interested in is what God had to say. And my favorite days are when that aligns with what I want and what everybody else already agrees with. Sometimes it happens, right? But there are days where it stands so opposed to everything that we love and stand for that people will call you everything in the book. But I can't, I, I don't want to make people happy. I want to make God happy. I want to find out what the truth is. And the end of Revelation warns us against these two errors. Revelation 22 said, if anybody adds to this book, I'm going to add to them the plagues that are in this book. And that book has demon locusts in it. You don't want that. And then he says, if anybody takes away from this book, I will take away his name from the book of life and his place in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is a good enough teacher for you and for me. Do not build another tabernacle on that mountain, Christian. It's enough to know Jesus. Zach and I were having this conversation the other day, and I made this point about something a couple years ago, and I've repeated it because it's become more relevant to me, and I, I am increasingly believing this. I don't need to learn anything from anybody else that is not Jesus. If God has something to say about it, 
I don't need to learn it from somebody else. The Bible talks an awful lot about love. Here comes along somebody else from the world saying, oh, here's what I think about love. Not interested. I don't need to learn love from you. I don't need to learn justice from you. I don't need to learn marriage from you. I don't need to learn finances from you. I don't need to learn theology or mythology or any such thing from you. God has told me everything I need. 2 Timothy says that the man of God may be complete. You got everything you need right there. Listen to him. Every word in that Bible is true. Don't neglect what makes you uncomfortable. If you read a verse in the Bible and it causes you to squirm in your seat, that's the one you need to pay attention to. Because maybe you're doing something and you've convinced yourself and all your friends that this is okay. And then you read what Jesus had to say about it again. And you go, I don't know how I can make that work. Then maybe it's time to submit yourself. Say, Lord, I love you so much. I will do it your way, even though I don't quite see it like that yet. And in time, you will find that he was right about it all. And if something in the Bible makes you angry, that's the part you need to pay attention to also. You ever read those verses? And something rises up in your heart and like you can hear those other voices. But what about this thing? What about that? What about this philosophy? What about this truth? What about this thing that I read? What about this scientific factor, this statistic? What about all of that? And you know, the Bible just sits there and I'm so glad that it's, it's just finished and done. Because you can stare at it and yell at it and try to make it say what you want all day long. And it just sits there black and white and sometimes red and saying, yeah, but this is what God has to say. The truth about Jesus is so glorious and so grand that any addition or subtraction will only diminish his splendor. So why would you want that? If you want to be part of the kingdom, you need to take a good hard look at the king. Because the revelation of the king is the revelation of the kingdom in truth. Listen to him.